Welcome back to another material world. Today we're going to be talking about a question that has dogged us for some time, which is a material explanation for cosmological redshift. So if you were to go and you were to look on Wikipedia or anywhere else for a consensus explanation for why things that are far away appear redder, you would read that it's the expansion of space-time. But this turns out to be a really unsatisfying explanation for us because when we really dig down into the math of space-time, we find something kind of funny, which is that space doesn't appear to be what it's made up to be. In other words, when I learned about these concepts, and if you go and watch Pop Sci Media about it, space is treated like some sort of substance. But in the mathematics of general relativity, and in the mathematics of mathematical physics and cosmological physics, space is essentially place. In fact, what we're really talking about is place-time. Can we you need. define, like, difference between space and place for me? Because I think that this is a really good point, and I just want to make sure that, like, everybody is able to grasp the significance of what you're trying to say. Like, when you differentiate between space... I'm sorry to interrupt. When you differentiate between space and place, what are you, what are you, what is the soul of what you're differentiating? Yeah, so space is generally going to tell us about the location of one body with respect to a bunch of other bodies that are inside of the presentation. And that coordinate system can set up a volume which might contain something, but it's really just the coordinate system of locations. It's really a system of places. So when we talk about space-time, we're talking about a dynamic series of places. And this is often used to tell us where an object is and how that location changes over time. But to say that the place is moving, the place of the star is changing, doesn't really tell us how that's happening materially. So. We have a couple of ideas about what might actually be going on materially, and we're going to bring in the radioelastic model of the atom, which if you haven't studied yet, please check out the primary video. We each have kind of a different take on this, and maybe you guys have some other ones, so let us know what you think in the comments section. So cosmological redshift, to me, on a material way, makes the most amount of sense as a product of material friction. So we've made videos where we talk about the way that the photon is a deformation of the filamentary connection that's in between atoms. Okay, but so if the photon is deforming a filamentary connection that's in between two separate atoms, then by necessity there has to be some kind of loss of energy during that deformation. And as you get a loss of energy in that deformation over these huge numbers of relays, as you're going all the way out to the very edge of the galaxy, or the very edge of the universe, then you're going to start to see a shift in the wavelength of light. And to me, that, that, is, that has to be at least one part of it. But I don't believe that you're going to come up with a single explanation where you put a pin down on the map of the universe and you're like, this is the one explanation for this. And so Shiloh has kind of... Well, before we move on to an alternative, I think that what you're saying is also reinforced by the idea that when light is transmitted across vast distances, you have a great amount of relay going on, mm. right? Our atomic model system is a nodal system where all interactions are either helped during transmission, this is essentially uh, diffraction and refraction, and processes like this, scattering, or you have reflection, which is just the, the, the re, well, it's just the re-emission of incoming momentum back towards its location. And you know, actually, this is a really interesting, sorry, I just want to say that. that's inevitably involves shock absorption and re-emission as an elastic process which necessarily has analogs of friction. Like obviously that concept of friction is an atomic process that applies on the atomic scale, but there must be some fibrous analogy of friction mm -hmm. which is occurring that dampens these effects where momentum is transferred down at the sub-level and you actually lose momentum at the subatomic level. I think that's a really good point. And this is also, this kind of touches on a different topic which we should make a, a, a movie about at some point. 
but it's about the, the nature of how far we can see. Like when we first started this project, I think that there was a very brief moment where we were talking to people who really believed that everything was a single object. And in order to be able to get light in between atoms, the atoms had to be directly connected in a single uninterrupted line. And we really quickly realized that that actually didn't make any sense because it seems impossible that you could get an atom that is all the way across the universe from us that happens to get here without anything in between us and it. What makes a lot more sense is this idea of energy loss during the process of relay. Yeah, it's all about relay in our model. Everything is a relay nodal architecture. Gravity, light, all the particularities of those come down to relay. And so this being one possibility that we're just losing momentum due to this transfer process that's happening across vast distances, which is going to inherently change how frequent, really, those pulses are being transmitted from one place to another. Because the, like, the, the amount of twist that you get into the filament is what's going to decide the wavelength of the light. And as you have less force available, as you have less energy available to twist it with each relay, you're going to start to gradually see this, this decrease in the frequency, which is an increase in the wavelength, which is a reddening of the yeah, light. Like it has to take time, right? It has to, each time that an atom absorbs, and re-emits light, it has to take a moment. It, it does, but to. that's not, it, like, it that... It has to slow down the process. It does, but that's, it's like a slightly different thing, the, the way that the light would change inside the filament, right? Because if, if there's a moment of absorption, and then there's a pause before it re-emits, I'm not sure that that's what decides the wavelength of the light, because the wavelength of the light is decided by the signal once it's being sent into the next filament, right? Okay, well check it out. What the hell is wavelength and frequency? Ah. Look, the atoms are breathing like this. This is how we imagine them, right? They're changing. Say the simplest kind of breath is from one ash shell to the next ash shell. It's just this kind of expansion and contraction of the You're shell. talking in like a high... I mean, anything that has like a circular outside shell, right? Like a big... Big, small, big, small, big, small. Sure, it could go S to P, like you could have a crazy change, which is going to stress the network periodically. Those periodic stresses are the inherent frequency of the light, because those deformations are being pulsed out into the network, right? Mm. And so our, the question we need to think about, maybe you guys have a better way of thinking about this, and please tell us, is when those those deformations are absorbed and another atom is brought into resonance with the atom which is exciting it in the first place does that takes does the energy that's lost frictionally change the breath rate of that atom commensurately or is the delay being read as a frequency shift mm, by itself that's a good question that's that's kind of where i'm at with it okay so and then I just wanted to mention another possibility, which is that, hey, galaxies which are 14 billion light years away, I mean, whatever what I, they say, 13.8, <laughs> right? We'll build a bigger telescope and see further ones. The galaxies that are really far away, they don't exist anymore, potentially. And so mm. that makes for a really interesting network architecture mm. where you can conceive of a situation where even those atoms might not exist anymore. They might have disintegrated and their fiber has been taken up and been made into new atoms. And if that's the case, then we should certainly expect that the tension is lessened on the connections uh, in that tree of nodal relay. Did someone, did someone mention this? Or did, uh, how it's did this... It's just an idea that I thought of, yeah. was he, uh, Okay, I wasn't sure that if somebody had brought this up in like the, the Facebook group or the Discord. I think it's my idea, but I, it doesn't really matter. It's just an idea. I just remember you coming to me one day and, and I, I, I can't remember. I remember you coming to me with the idea, but I don't remember if there was I'm like an associated I'm 99% sure this is actually my idea, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The point of this project is not to get Nobel Prizes. The point of this project is to explain what's happening because we want to know. And but if you came up with the idea, let us know and we'll give you credit. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> totally. So 
those are our two possibilities. Maybe you guys have some more, but we are certainly looking for a material explanation for this cosmological redshift because it is a super tight relationship. It does appear to be a thing, and I don't think it has anything to do with just the places of the atoms changing. That's kind of preposterous. Well, the, the distance between the atoms increasing without it affecting the atoms themselves. Like, the explanation... It's not an explanation. <laughs> it, it's not an explanation. No one can satisfyingly explain it. It's Every time you start to talk to somebody about it, they get real squidgy, and I, I, don't, I don't like it. And so this is, this is something that I can wrap my brain around. And whether it is the, the decrease of energy as it travels through a physical medium, or if it's because the, the, the atoms that are on the other end of the relay have been folded up into other atoms, and so they're no longer in the same conformation. They're not anchoring it, right? Yeah, the tension yeah, yeah. is lessened, something like that. Whichever one it is, there might be other versions of this explanation, but it certainly seems to make a lot more sense to me than this nebulous idea of the expansion of space-time causing a red light shift. Per se. Maybe that's the effect that's observed, mm. but that's not an explanation to me. All right. We'll see you next week. See you guys.